Uh, all right, cool. And with that, we'll get we'll get rolling. So thanks everybody for joining. My name is Jeff Everhart, and I am joined today uh, by Jeff Taylor. So it is the tale of two Jeffs today. Uh, and our topic this afternoon is building headless shops with Woo GraphQL. Um, so I've got just a couple slides and then I'm pretty much turning it over to Jeff and he's going to sort of walk us through a demo and educate us all on using Woo GraphQL, uh, which is a product that he develops and maintains. But first, I'll just throw out an etiquette alert. Please be excellent to one another. I think, like I said, I poorly manage these live streams sometimes. So I believe you could all unmute. So please don't abuse it. Um, this is being recorded. I don't want to have to go and edit anything out. I think Jeff may also be using a live demo site, right, Jeff, that we put up on WP Engine this morning or yesterday yeah, afternoon. Um, so if you're, please don't mess with the URL. It'll be exposed. Don't, don't, don't mess with it. Don't make us regret doing that. Um, but before we kick that off, I think we just need to give Jeff a huge shout out for all the work he does across the ecosystem. Uh, I know we our last couple of presentations have tried to focus on people doing all of the excellent work in the GraphQL ecosystem. We've been able to share a number of cool plugins and products, and so I'm happy to continue that today. Um, Jeff is definitely the man. He's behind a bunch of different tools uh, that we all probably use and take for granted that he's worked really hard to build and maintain. So he's one of the heroes definitely that we want to recognize here. Uh, so three cheers for Jeff. Thank you for all that you do. Um, we definitely appreciate all your work and sacrifice and dedication to keep this headless WordPress dream alive. Um, and so I've got a couple of links today that I'll sort of start throwing in the chat. Uh, and I'll do that sort of maybe once Jeff gets going. Oh, that's why. Uh, and so what we've got is we've got this uh, Woo GraphQL demo. This is sort of the demo application that Jeff built for these purposes and sort of as a teaching tool to help people learn about Woo GraphQL. And then he re really quickly put together like a five piece tutorial that's basically like, I write the more in-depth version of what we're gonna cover today. So in addition to watching the video later, you can also walk through this tutorial. And then we've got a couple of links just to learn a little bit more about Jeff and his projects. Um, so go ahead and Jeff, I think if you wanna take over, man. Yeah, Go for it. Let me stop you. sharing real quick and we'll get rolling. And All I'll right. sort of th start throwing these links into into the chat. All right, so can everybody see my screen Is, and, and, and tell me if it's too wide? Um, yep, I, I I'm good. I can see. All right, so... Um, we can take a quick step around. This is the back end for the site we'll be using to host our store. Uh, we can take a quick look around, but it's essentially set up. Uh, has just a few products, a few WooCommerce products. Uh, you all imported from the sample data you get from uh, WooCommerce. Uh, and, I, and it has Stripe set up with just a, a test, uh, with just test keys for, for payments. Beyond that, uh, once you have your store set up, it's on to just the Woo GraphQL configurations, which we'll start with at, uh, I don't even know if I opened that, I have another tab, uh, <clears throat> with just these settings. By default, when you activate Woo WP GraphQL, it will not <laughs> have this checked, uh, which is public introspection, which is pretty much vital for development most of the time. So we'll be enabling it now, hit save changes. The other thing we'll need is when, active, when WP GraphQL uh, WooCommerce is activated, it'll add these settings here. In particular, we're going to need these settings, cart URL, checkout URL, and account URL. By enabling them, we give our uh, schema the ability to pass back uh, session passing authentication uh, URLs. We'll get more into it, but just know that by using these URLs, we can send a user from the front end application to our WordPress installation and have them automatically be authenticated and directed to specifically where we want them to go. In particular, these links we're, need, we're using are the cart URL, the checkout URL, and account URL. Cool. And so let me, and just for the people watching and people uh, who are going to watch it after this, Jeff, uh, I think the whole back end you have, right, is kind of available as a Docker instance in that uh, it is, GitHub yeah. so, repo, um, right? So if you just run run a couple of commands install docker you can get that up and running pretty much with um 
you know, zero config. And I think what we'll do, what we can also try and do is uh, maybe I can work with Jeff after this to distribute this as a local blueprint too. Uh, so yeah. that you can kind of just drag it and drop it into the local dev environment like, if that's what you use. Yeah, and it, it's, it's, it's very, very, uh, just really basic. And it's, it's almost identical to uh, when I, I think I copied it from BitPoke a while back. Okay. But uh, it's, a, it's, it's mostly maintained by, uh, by, and Composer. Composer manages all your plugins and whatnot. It's very convenient when you're in development or if you're just a one-man development team maintaining the WordPress <laughs> site. So very convenient. Uh, back over here. With this in, but with this set, with this all set up and uh, activated, we can move on to our application. Uh, I have my editor over here, uh, and <clears throat> I guess I can go. I could try and go through it, but like you said, this is a bit small. Uh, we're not going to go through the files, and I just just wanted to let everyone. This is just almost a base, a really basic Next 13 app that I created using MPX Create Next app, and I ran through the the uh, basic setup and settings. Uh, beyond that, I've added an EVN local uh, to provide all these uh, fields I need. Right, uh, and pretty much with the exceptions of these three and these two, these could, these other ones can be whatever you want them to be. They're just used throughout the application for specific things. Uh, as we get to them, I'll go into go go over them maybe a little bit more, but there's not too much to them beyond the fact that they just store certain parts in either local storage or session storage, depending on if they have the SS or the LS. We'll let you know. <clears throat> the other ones that do matter what values they are are this nuts key and nuts salt, as well as our obvious endpoints, front end and back end. Uh, these ones, the first ones at the top, they should be pretty obvious what they are here. Uh, but these two at the bottom are specifically have to come from WordPress if, if we are going to use them. We can get around without them, and we will be we'll, in the beginning, we will start with, but we'll come back to them. These values have to match their equivalent on WordPress for us to use them for our uses here. Uh, so beyond that, moving onwards, these values also have to be passed in to our next config. So it's readily available to our application. And with those EVNs, we essentially need, that's most of the functionality required for what we need. Everything else that I'm about to show you besides the code, besides one other file is almost related to like styling. So first things first is the, we're using uh, Tailwind config. And it's just the basic setup that next comes out of the box with. I think the only thing I added was these here. With Next 13, things are split up into server and uh, client components. I compartmentalize the, the uh, components that way. And a few components that are used repeatedly across and shared are put here. Specifically, if you're familiar with Shad UI or uh, libraries like that, I put those components in here. Um, continuing onward, the last big thing before we jump into any actual code and actually run the demo is uh, our usage of GraphQL code. GraphQL Cogen, if you're not familiar with it, is a uh, is a tool specifically, like this name says, is uh, it generates code. So uh, and it generates code specifically to our GraphQL endpoint. We use uh, there are a number of ways to, uh, to use it, but primarily here it's used to generate types for both our GraphQL schema and the queries and operations that we run. Uh, this takes away all the guesswork of figuring out what comes from a query and what comes from a type. Because uh, at this point, once it's given the TypeScript and you're given, they're given the types, your editor typically or VS Code or whatever you intend to take over as far as telling you what needs to come, what comes from what and where. Uh, <clears throat> continuing onward, uh, well, no, before we go forward, have I lost anybody? <laughs> uh, no, and so this code gen piece is part of the reason why you turned on that public introspection, right? Is that yes. that needs to yeah, query the, your GraphQL schema to generate those types? Yeah, and you'll see it when I actually start the build process. You see the GraphQL code gen generating the file that we that's used in the beginning of the process. Okay. So let's get started real quick. Let me um, cool. And now, and we when we haven't seen the demo site, right? So you're about to fire that up. Yep. Uh, after you do your your salts trick, right? No, I just have to remove a file. <laughs> uh, 
that's all we discussed. Uh, and then, uh, then I'm just gonna do a quick move. And so D Dave's got a question. Are you also using GraphQL ES Lint with those code gen types? You, no, not not like it's it's the lint that comes in the box that comes out of the box with uh with next and it so it doesn't do anything specific to the uh code gen uh okay so now we just want to run it now so we're, we're sort yeah. of running, and cool uh, y'all and so framework question for everybody is everybody using next throw your framework of choice in the like if you're going to use woocraft graphql what are you going to use it with Throw that in the chat. I'd be interested to see. Astro for life, Fran. Did we convert you? Next, next, next. Faust. Okay. Oh man, everybody's Wait, next. Well, and so then follow up question to that: How many of y'all have explored Next Thirteen yet in the app directory? Or are you waiting? Waiting because I'm busy. Yeah, that's how I generally was. I'm never on the bleeding edge of every anything. Um, yeah, we're we. I just saw Doc, the Faust yeah. exploring. Um, ain't nobody got time for that. Waiting to. Yep, yeah. I'm never on the bleeding edge of everything. And I said, joke with Fran. I make unpopular tech choices and have done so pretty much my whole career. So like uh, when React exploded, I was like, I'm not learning React. I'm going full on view. <laughs> no, I'm, not, I'm not next i'm i'm team astro like i'll keep doing it it's fine it's worked out for me so far all right how are we doing jeff we back on track oh i i would like i don't know what like it's um one second <laughs> okay should we i mean if it's not you want to kill it start my, uh, like... configuration that we just used is it either has a schema field I remember we changed something, and then I changed it back. I'm not sure what it's complaining for now. Uh, you want to check what it is against the tutorial? Let me see if I can find. What would that be on, like, step two, right? Yeah. I'm and you're in what next I need config to or you, the code gen config file? Ah, ah, I know what I did wrong. I, I know what I did wrong. I moved the file out of the folder. <laughs> uh, that'll do it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That'll mother. do it. That'll do it, yeah. All right, so sorry for the delay. <laughs> NPM run dev. Sorry. I was honestly confused there. No, but, uh, no worries, oh, man. Live oh, coding is always... Now, uh, it's one of those things like it's not for the faint of heart at all. Now, remember what I said about how it mentions it in our uh, config? This is what lets us know whether it's been properly rendered or not. And we end up with this GraphQL generate, slash generated file here. And okay. it's, it's a, it is really hard to read, but it does what you need to do. Uh, I'm not going to break down what each part of these are, but just know that it includes the types for our schema the types for our operations and a neat little wrapper for us to use with the client for us to run these operations simplistically. Um, and now if we load, if we navigate to, uh, did I have another one open already? I think I did. Yeah. yeah so now we're going to go visit localhost 3000, right? And this yes. is your front end app getting ready to spin up. Mm hmm. <clears throat> now, I tried to keep everything very, very basic, and it it, it still got really complicated at points. Uh, if you've built anything in W in, in with WooCommerce, you are very familiar with these products that I'm that are on the screen at the moment. Uh, they're the sample products that you see pretty much everywhere, uh, but we can go in through. Uh, each component on the shop page uh, before diving into uh, the filters. And let me show you what said what the filters are. Uh, when the accessory button is clicked, we get all the accessories, it's filtered. 
It's typically know also that because we are in the dev, like I'm running a dev server in Next, it's outrageously slow. Uh, <laughs> you'll find once you build and actually just run a build, it's obscenely fast compared to how fat how how slow it is in the dev server. Pretty much because it has it, every one of these clicks results in a page render when it typically wouldn't if it was already built. If that makes sense. And does this still, I know in the initial demo you showed me, it had like a thousand products. Do you still have that many products in this demo? Oh, no, because I couldn't get the I couldn't get the smooth generator onto the server. It just has 20, <laughs> it just has 20 here. Okay, uh, okay. In, in, the, in the tutorial, I absolutely show how you can just generate the, the hundred pro the products. But like here, we're just doing 20. Okay, cool. We got a number of filters. And so you want to maybe walk through the code of that page and just sort of show yeah. folks what that looks like. And maybe I think it'd be cool to call out if you could, like where where you use the GraphQL code gen piece in this example. That yeah, kind of that, neat. That, that, that's, uh, so well, let's start with the, the actual page component itself. Now the page component is just this root page component here with simply two components. It does, uh, Now, you say mention GraphQL code gen. I got to bring that up too. Um, oh, yeah. Sorry. I, I'm interested in it. And I know I, other people. Oh, no, no, no. It's, it's my... fine. It's just I have to prepare all the pages. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, my bad. Uh, no, it's, it's like I could just, it's, it's, it's all fun. It's all fun. All right. So let's start from this page and then step to the GraphQL code gen stuff. This is all being used here in tandem. So we have, this is all coming from GraphQL code gen. These three functions here fetch product, fetch, cate fetch categories, and fetch colors. Are three functions straight coming from Graph that are you that utilize GraphQL code gen and are essentially wrappers about ab around wrappers. Uh, as you know, as I'm sure you're familiar with at this point, Graph WP GraphQL uses pagination for just about everything, mm -hmm. which depending on who you ask is a good or a bad thing. But like the you, at some point you're going to need to get all the data back, uh, especially when it comes to the static building process here. So in this case. We're getting all the products, and uh, all this fetch products does is is a simple wrapper. It's not a simple wrapper, but it is a wrapper for our uh, our interfacing with uh, GraphQL code gen. So GraphQL code gen, for the most part, is um, is all this SD. It will, well, as far as we we really everything else that's coming from here is a type. All we actually the only function, the only thing we actually use outside of a, as a as a non-typescript type, the non-typescript sense is get SDK. Uh, so we have two functions that really play a role that you'll see throughout the application, which is get, get client and get client with SDK. Okay. Their usage should be pretty obvious. The one thing to note though is the client itself is designed in a way so it won't repeatedly make a GraphQL client over and over again. So it makes one and continuously passes back that uh, that instance to everybody to prevent it from just having to reinitialize one over and over again. Uh, and then beyond that, we have all these uh, these functions for fetching. Since most of them fetch off connections, I made a initial connection result object just so I can have a blank connection result in case I don't get anything back and there's no error thrones. And I simply do... Uh, within the function, a try and catch to grab all those products. This, the code is almost identical to the, to the uh, product categories one down below, except that it uses a different, uh, simply a different quarry. Yeah, and, and so, yeah, let's take a look at just one of those lines, maybe like line 80, right? Cause that's in his essence, what graph QL code gen provides you, right? Yep. So you get this client and then you can just call client dot get shop categories which it's already written that query for you on the back end, and you sort of just pass in your, you know, your variables or whatever, right? Yep. Okay, that is kind of beautiful. And so I, one more time, I repeat it with, with, with uh, colors. And then and also in here is just the one for the end of it. We'll get into this one later. It's just the one for that I use on the single product page. Yeah. Okay, uh, awesome. Uh, back over in the page, we have these two components here. We'll step into the shop component first because the real meat and potatoes is the shop provider. Uh, but the shop component is essentially, <clears throat> so 
now this is a this might be a little bit like it, it was something it was a concept that i actually had to uh think about a bit deep more deeply because i had to ch with the changing of servers and, and uh servers and client components coming in and making the way we change you write next applications change entirely mm -hmm. this is a server component this one is a client component this one is essentially a, a responsible for the initial initial load and then sub and then like it does no community does no interaction whatsoever it gives the products renders everything related to it and then just keeps going there's no it's, it's, a, it's a simple uh functional component with no interaction with no uh no states beyond the initial mount because of the, and this is also the same thing like like sidebar is essentially uh is this section here it gets its own component though, because if we go and make this a mobile, you'll see that it's an actual sidebar. Okay. That's why it gets its own component. That's also still a server component though. There's no real interaction. I'm doing that with Tailwind. Uh, these other ones here specifically categories, shop categories. Shop categories is this component, colors is this component down here versus colors. Price range is this component down here. And search bar and shop listing is, yeah. And so Fran's These got a question. Is, is the, so the shop component is essentially an SSR component, right? An RSC? Yep. Okay. And all the other ones that, you, that I mentioned just now are all client components that have some form of interaction. Oh, uh, interesting. And so there's really no way for you to tell from the actual component whether one's a client or a server component, right? Like, uh, you mean from this? If I'm looking at it from this from view, from yeah. The outward set. I mean, from where I'm from this file right now, I guess like I guess you no. import, you know where you're importing it from, right? Is that the difference? Yep, this lives in the server folder. On top okay. of that, the, uh, one thing I go over in the tutorials that I, I can go over here is for client the different thing. For, client components and server components writing wise is truly just their import just the barrel file i use for them the okay. barrel file i use for clients includes use clients okay uh, but essentially otherwise you wouldn't know this is because throughout development you might find yourself repeatedly moving components back and forth between the two and it's easier just to have to move the file without having to edit it yeah, I'm just comparing it to Astro where I'd have like a directive. I'm saying I'm using this on the client, on the component, like when I use it, Yeah. Um, which I think is, I, I don't know, like I, I clearly I like it, um, but I get not everybody. Oh, no, no, I, I'm, I, I I'm like sorry, I'm not trying to sidetrack us. Hold on, let's keep rolling. Yeah, I don't want to take back. us off course. We've, we've only got up to half an hour left and you still got a lot, a lot of cool yeah, stuff to show people. So let me not, so, Leah, let me not sidetrack us. So beyond this, we can take a look at... Uh, a few of these real quick. So shop categories is <clears throat> is essentially it has really one real behavior is in how it reacts when you click on its buttons. Uh, and essentially what it does is for first and foremost, these are all links. Every one of these is a link. Like, simply be, so everything is is linkable and you can come back to it. So like if I was to go in here and just start typing in, let's say B. It's not going to show it right now. But yeah, it, it takes a little second, but you see Beanie show up up there. Yeah. Uh, pretty much everything works in a, in a way where it updates the link without actually updating any of the context related to this. So when it updates the link, that's where our shop provider comes in. So since, since this is written a link now that has it added as categories, accessories, our shop provider processes that at the top. So introduced in next were use path names and use search params which are the primary ways of getting the parts of the quarry uh and within the shop provider we're not going to go into this function but this is the function <laughs> is all the filtering it takes that state and processes it so like by reading those but, but it breaks that it, it breaks down the uh, individual quarry params and filters the products based upon those pro provided quarry params And that's cool. how we end up with the filtering on the front end. It goes from the top downwards, but 
would pro it's provided with all the props and everything else is provided with all the I mean it's provided with all the products and so is the the root parent and the root parent just renders it as is and the provider updates and that's when we see the effects. Cool, cool. Uh, so so maybe like the next step I think for for folks would be like uh you know we've got all this stuff i know lo login like authentication adding stuff to the cart like that's all a huge part of what we graphql simplifies for people so you think we could uh trend that way next yes sir that's that that, that, that is the next port portion of beyond okay, this cool. is the login so i didn't actually make any users on the back end account <laughs> to test the login part with so um let's just make a quick test one uh, and David's got a quick question. Are the filters a new query to WP GraphQL or filtering the initial result? It kind of looked like with the JavaScript filtering the initial result, right? What the, uh, I think maybe with, uh, what you just showed the, the filters, the search, maybe. Which are there new, Nothing here is actually speaking to the back end at this point. Okay. So that's just taking the initial products we have. Your products. Okay. Uh, so like from that point, there's no, there's no communication with the back end. No, no, it's not taking advantage of any filtering on the back end or nothing like that because okay. it's, it's just highly performant and better nature of doing it on all of the client at that point when you're dealing with like, cause if you don't have a powerful server and in most cases, WordPress servers aren't that powerful to begin with, uh, we want to avoid hitting it when we can and exactly. we can kind of cache so like that data for, and, and, st and like just doing and for static components like that it, it just it just seems like the uh just the better idea to do it that way simply because you're never going to beat the performance of a static page doing it any other way I just made this account here, but, but no. Before before that, let's uh, let, yeah, because we can we can speed speed things up. So before that, uh, let's add some things to the uh, to the cart uh, just to show interaction. So we have our shop page here. Our shop page. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to login. Our, our, the shop page itself is very is, is completely a static page for the most part. Almost every part of this is static except for this section here. So if we actually look at the it's under shop product in this time, uh, and then um, crap, I need the page. It's almost identical to, <laughs> to to the last page, just with different queries being run and different components. But the, essentially, they work within the very same manner. You have your per, you have your original static component that gets all the initial data, and then that renders as fast as well. That, that's rendered and processed as, as quickly as, it, as as you normally would expect. And then you have your product provider, which starts processing on the client. Uh, and so we can hop into we already have the shop page open, the shop product page open, and so you'll see that like it's as you go through this is nothing outrageous it's, it's all this stuff here we, we see here we have like the color attributes that's being rendered right here that's being rendered in one of these tabs from shad uh from shad cn uh but uh i don't know it's this one right here it's confusing as all but this is our attributes tab here and we have like our description which is which comes in html from wordpress so i just dangerously drop here but it's not uncommon and it's not a bad idea if you're ever dealing with this issue and don't want to deal with HTML, it's just to pass raw <laughs> to, the, yeah. to one of the descriptions to get back the raw value. That's not a bad, that's not, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but as you get, like, we have all sorts of, uh, but it's, it's nothing's being, uh, nothing abnormal is being done there. We're taking the product data, we're rendering it. Uh, where the abnormalities come in is for cart options. And uh, so cart options rely heavily on this product provider, which re which works in tandem. Uh, well, actually, no, cart options for variations relies heavily on this. So we can actually probably leave this alone for now. 
but <laughs> yeah well and so just looking at our outline jeff looks like you might have skipped a little bit ahead i think we were oh, i did i'm rearranging the order yeah because <laughs> i had to okay. make a, cut, a user uh so okay. I wanted to show, and i wanted to showcase uh the interactivity of things with the actual uh with the cart and the user account as well so okay what i mean is, and what i mean by that is let us go back here let's add a few items to the cart uh so we'll add this one here and let's go and let's go look for a variation really fast uh the best way to find that is to click on colors <laughs> yeah and 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 just some commentary for y'all when i was like spend some time with jeff walking through this demo the the variable of what are they called Vari variations variable products or like whatever that stuff is in in woocommerce like oh, i think i've been sleeping on how complex e-commerce stuff can be um because he was even just showing me the screens to edit the stuff in woocommerce and i was like wow man this is so much so many edge cases so many little things to think about um so kudos to anybody who's doing active e-commerce development this is tough so we're here on a variation page and uh as you can see without logos in green it's not available <laughs> it watches for that state uh so the the biggest this is the primary use of the product provider when the different attributes are changed on this page it looks for a selected attribute, a selected variation that thought that matches the attribute provided. And I don't, I don't even, I will slightly probably go into the code for this, but not likely it's, I mean, you're better off looking at the tutorial than me going over it in like in person. It's, it's one, it's not, it's a lot. <laughs> like, yeah. like, I don't even There's... know how to, like, it's not, it's not poorly written. It's not, not cleaner. It's just a lot. So, um, but from a high level, I will discuss uh, what I can without going too far into the weeds. We'll start by adding this to the cart because there's something that needs to be shown and probably should be known to discuss too. So see how this one's in the cart, right? This one without a logo, this green one. If we click on the blue one, it changes back to remote. We no longer see our cart state, but if we go back, we do. That plays a that is a lot has to do with uh, going back to our session provider. Session provider doesn't just store data for the customer; it stores data for their cart as well. So that session provider provides uh, provides logic to our cart options object, and it does it in a way where <clears throat> it does it in a way where it's like, it's not. It can that same data that's passed to this page can still be passed as input for the cart without any decoration or anything like that. Because for certain attributes, in particular local attributes that aren't already set on a variation, you have to manually provide that to the cart input. Uh, and as we discussed that earlier, and there's different ways to to, to create your variations, but this isn't an uncommon way. And as like if you're developing e-commerce sites on a regular basis, you will likely run up into a situation where you have to deal with these type of variations. Uh, the problem is, is like they can be of not like if you have a, a store with a lot of variety, this can make your code very gnarly. <laughs> like, like I mentioned, so. Instead of just like this talking about, and I did skip over one other thing. Um, the things that these two rely on, uh, and this is probably the most important part, I really skipped over it, um, is a hook that I created years ago and been peddling for years called Use Cart Mutations. This hook does, it relies, again, it relies on the, sessions, the session provider to get the cart, but what it also does is it provides to the component that is using it the immediate state of the product you are looking for within said cart. That's how when this when I click on different different types, it changes because the variables for this hook are immediately changed and a new product is looked for within the cart. If we look at our really gnarly variable component variable cart options and try and step through this, um, 
no, we're not gonna do this. <laughs> Even I don't want to. Like, no, I yeah, don't want nobody do that. We won't. We no, we won't, and y'all definitely go that. out and look at it because, like, there there is <laughs> yeah. so much here, and that's what we're joking about in chat. Where like David said, this was fire code base, and I said it's pretty much like Woo Next with all the features, so much more than a demo. Because you really did, man. I mean, you. This is pretty much like a fully functioning e-commerce store. That people could slap to their own airport and just get bro, old. Now, now you know how, how much I don't want to answer any more questions. <laughs> like, so, <laughs> but instead of going through, but I'm not going to leave everybody hanging. I'm not going. I'm. I'm. We're not going through variable card options. We are going okay. through simple card options. Simple, instead. simple card options. Yeah. yeah or, so simple card options. You'll find that it doesn't even actually rely on the context of the product provider. That's because the product provider's primary usage is for moving around variations so if you're using a variable product chances are like instance where where i might change to a different attribute this very this product this variation might have a different image or it might have a different price all those are things that wouldn't yeah. be attached to the parent product and wouldn't wouldn't be known unless that information is being passed to the to the uh to the uh, cart mutation to know what should I be looking for. Uh, but the problem is, is even after you know that, <laughs> depending on how you made your uh, your product page, how does anything else know what to change? How does how do they know what variation is what, what very like, what needs to be displayed? That's where the product very the product provider comes in. It's specifically I specifically designed it for variation products. But it has other usages amongst the other types. Like group products would have a usage for it because group group products are selling multiple products. So it would have its own set of group products. Uh, and external products is coming completely different. But in this case, like the primary usage is for dealing with variations on this page. Uh, and the reason I'm I'm leaning, I feel like it's going to end up being a common pattern going forward simply because static and server client, server and client server and uh client components has has sort of forced this forced my hand <laughs> as much as much as this design as i've done it myself like they kind of forced it to be the shape that it is so if we keep going forward you, you, you'll see that like most much of this is really just toast everything is almost all done in that hook i told you about and it's really just processing of this form uh so you have your input you have if there's at a, if it's out of stock it'll display out of stock if it's sold individually you won't see this input because that means you only sell one at a time and uh because you don't have to do it this way i just did it this way uh instead of typically when you get the price from wp GraphQL WooCommerce, it comes formatted already with whatever currency symbol that you are using has but a lot of times you want to do math with that to display, like if I want to increase the input, we get an increased price. That's that's pretty much all this is doing, is updating that based upon the number of input we have. And it uses the raw price from uh, the product to get it instead of using the, the decorated one. And these are all our buttons, which, which, uh, which deal with state, which if you're actually running a mutation, it won't actually, it'll like disable it like normal and show the loading symbol. Uh, and we can also update and all those things like work as well. Uh, but I think we've, we, we, we're good on here and we can move on to finishing up with login. We good? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Let's, yeah, I think that once, once we get into that stuff, it'll probably bring up yeah. more questions. And the reason I moved login to the end is really is, is because uh, one thing that I felt that needed to be shown and needs to be known, and and I need to focus mostly on the nuts part of this as opposed to this, the cart options part of this, is gnarly and is as big as this is. Uh, so getting on to the last part and really the most important part, I feel, um, let it hit the loaded, uh, load up, let it load the login page. And I think that's what's happening. Not getting low loaded off. <laughs> uh, did we crash your server, your local server? I think it's Chrome. 
my local because the local server isn't getting a ping. Oh man. Yeah, like it just well, it I wouldn't just be the first time there. Google Chrome has overloaded itself. But you only have one tab, Jeff. How did this happen? Oh, I'm in an incognito window. Oh, okay. All the other tabs are in the other one. All right, so ignore the error. <laughs> Every now and then, uh, I never, I'm never, if you're not on a beefy server and uh, you don't have any catching, caching involved, you might end up from time to time getting 502 errors. Uh, uh, in this case, it was just a 500, but typically it's a 502 error for a bad gateway. And uh, I honestly think it's just your, your, the server is dropping the response because it's getting so many at once. Uh, yeah. Next, the next dev server sends all your requests twice, if you didn't know, because it builds all your components twice. Uh, that's only in dev, though. So going onwards, we're going to log in now. Uh, I made that user cinnamon. And I think I still have the password. Nope. <laughs> uh, I was gonna say that's a long time to have the same thing in a. That's what I'm saying. That is a, so you know what we're gonna do. <laughs> yeah, just good old fresh password. And I'm gonna make. I, I don't want to do this, but I'm gonna do it. <laughs> All right. I can never forget. Like I that said, one. we we <laughs> had those etiquette slides at the beginning for a reason. Please, nobody hack them afterwards. Um, hack this uh, thing with the cinnamon password user. And welcome to our guest that just popped in a second ago. You'll, you'll be able to catch the first uh, 35 minutes of this, 45 minutes of this on YouTube in just a couple of days when we throw it up there. But we have, uh, what have we done so far? Let's kind of just recap, right? We talked about setting up stuff. Uh, Jeff here walked through his application. We talked about the shop page, some single product page components, uh, adding stuff to the cart. Now we're on to kind of log in, check out sort of that whole like authenticated oh. flow. I just realized something. Fuck, I'm dumb. I forgot. Oh, no. <laughs> All right, people. One of the most key important things that you should remember if you want to authenticate is if you want to use this stupid plugin, you have to remember to add a really dumb salt. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, crap. Oh, uh, you know, but you know what? We have, we, we can cheat the system. Um, where are you at? And because you're this weird because they have it. Here we go. I'm just gonna write it somewhere <laughs> in one of these. Uh, yep. Preferably the earliest one I can do it in without causing an issue. You know what? Can you do it in there? Do it right here. <laughs> Be fine. Uh, excuse me for not uh, for not like. Yeah, uh, let's see. Can we open it up real quick? Yeah, let you just look up the thing for me. And, I, and I'm not even going to do a check for uh, the one. Uh... Uh, yeah, oh, you know what? I don't even I'll... need to. Oh, you don't? Do you want it in Slack? You don't need it? Bear, I, like, I, you, you forget who I am. <laughs> I've built almost everything. I have it in a dot in <laughs> somewhere. Like, uh, who am I talking about? Somewhere. <laughs> Development always. Uh, yeah. All right, that's good. Um, and so from here, login should work. Sorry for all the delays for, on my part. And I think I messed up again. Well, no, let's refresh it, so I'm sure. I'm trying to think if that was. Oh, I think we got it's been it. Been in longer than last time. Yeah, I think we got it. There we go. And okay, so now cool. you have uh, log out, account, checkout, and cart. Now we click on cart. This, this is this is the, where the start of the magic really happens. We click on cart, and <laughs> uh, oh, you know what? No, I just realized what what it is. Oh, 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 oh. I'm not using the nonsense here. No, I don't. Because did you ever replace those? When things were going wrong. I didn't. I did. Uh, I ended up uh, just turning the thing. Yeah, commenting it out. It really shouldn't be necessary though, since I am doing like this. Um, 
Every now and then this sort of thing happens. Am I on? Oh, you know what? Do you have history here? <laughs> uh, let's go that. No, no, we're going to stay here real fast and we're going to actually just kill any potential session that's existing here. So let me explain uh, essentially as I'm going through this, what it is that we are doing and what it is that the code itself is supposed to be doing. WP GraphQL WooCommerce defines a uh, endpoint of sorts that will take a that, that and, and also def that will take a provided nuts and then process it against a, against the user that is also provided in the URL um, and then decide whether to authenticate the user based upon those credentials if everything is done properly. Now, typically, this would be really like un like this would be really like unsecure. But there's also WP GraphQL relies on a user session value that could be set from the client. So at the start of uh, um, at the start of a of a of a um, session, like when a user navigates the application, this value should be taken, and and once it's taken, it should be such like, stored. Uh, and like the thing is. The value can, like most things, the value can be whatever you want it to be, but it's better if it's more than just an arbitrary number, but something tangible to the machine and the end user, like an IP or an IP or their user agent or MAC address, and just like sort of hashed for their local machine to identify this user session with the uh, the session in question. Wait, am I, did I? logged in now every little thing is just one bit by bit yeah. piece of debugging <laughs> like you get it started up it doesn't come together exactly how you need it like ever you know what i just and and this could this be anything with the salts in the in your emv file Dude, I would hit myself in the fucking chest. All right, people. <laughs> okay, before this, I actually, this is the issue that I had earlier that I asked you about, and it turned out it was my fault. All right, there is something that, like, it's a bug that's in WP GraphQL that I, in the settings that I feel like it's more of me to know. All right, when these are disabled, they are no longer saved in the settings, right? So the second you actually activate them, and you see them here, they're still not in the settings. You have to hit save changes again for these values to actually be set. Otherwise, when you come over here, it doesn't see any nonces and it doesn't give you the right page. That's what our issue was. Sorry about okay. that, everybody. Uh, and now you see we're at our cart page. Um, Jeff's committed here, to getting a bug release fix out for this by 6 p.m. today. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Oh, I probably am. Like, it's like, no bullshit. Like, that aggravated me so much getting this started up because I had everything working. But the thing is, what, uh, real quick, let's keep going. Um, if you update the state here, it will be reflected in your app. So if I update this item here, now I have three instead of five, and I navigate back to the to the application, you'll see that the number of cart items I have has gone down to, I think, six. Yeah. Okay. Also... You are you have already pretty much taken on a session on the back end as well. So from here, the user can just go to checkout. They could also go to checkout from the front end as well, and it'll still work. So to okay, cool. And so let's uh, let's unpack this for a second, just just so we can really sort of re-explain. I think what's happening here in the way you've got this stuff set up, because okay, I think there's exactly. two there's two right. options for this, right? So right now you're essentially offloading the cart and the checkout pages back to your main WordPress install, right? Yeah. So let me explain. Um, these, if we go back to this setting, everyone remembers these fields here that I checked and enabled. That's what we're using to uh, to get to the front end. We're, we're calling a mutation here in this API route that's actually just uh, called at the beginning of the, uh, like if we were to come in here, Open up the networks tab. Can I make this any bigger? I can. And then we're just going to refresh the page. You will see it's 
I believe it's slash API slash nuts, or you you just see the nuts here. Okay. And, and in our case, we get back these. Uh, that's our payload. So we get back these URLs. These URLs, uh, while they're not they're not the final destination URLs, obviously. The when, when used, the user will, like if I was to take this one here, copy value, and put it over here. I'm on my I'm on my own account page. Okay. They're that simple to use. They don't necessarily discriminate. The problem with what what we what the so 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 what we want to do is we actually want to avoid doing this. Like like period. We want to avoid actually using a query to get these. So instead, what we're going to do is um, <clears throat> while this will still be here because we're actually this isn't actually qu the querying part. This is the generation part. And this will still be here. This nuts thing will still be here. All the requests, we, we get this directly from the endpoint. We don't want to do that. So we want to be able to generate it on the client. And to generate it on the client, it's actually outrageously simple. We just copy a couple of uh, WordPress. We re I've rewritten a bunch of a couple of WordPress functions in, in JavaScript to, to mimic the, the creation of a, a graph, a nuts, the, the same way they do it on their side. So with these uncommented and now that commented they they'll start doing that, but we might, th but there's still going to be likely one error with the URL that okay. mostly has to do with better op. Yeah. And so it with, with woo graph QL, right? So that do you have the option as well to build an entirely headless checkout scenario? And then David asked yeah. like, what are the pros, pros and cons of maybe both? Yeah, you, there is. Let me explain. We can, we can do it on the checkout page. Um, so you can easily, well, not easily, you can recreate this on your client application, on your application. The problem comes in when you're dealing with payments. <laughs> okay. uh, and, and, and pretty much any, 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 any extension that you do to alter something around checkout, that's when the problems come to come in. Uh, did I not enable it or set it up or, or whatever? I didn't set it up. Uh, but But like the certain things like ch payment gateways, there is no real way to make a, a headless checkout page that supports all those, all the endpoints that you might have available, all the uh, payment gate processes you might have available okay. in your back end. Uh, the, pretty much what it always ends up coming to is you the end the 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 client ends up have have having to uh, pretty much uproot a large portion of like, like just do it outside of WordPress. You're using WordPress for products and you're adding your, you're, you're not doing payment processing there. You're creating the, uh, the order there as a sort of an afterthought where it's already been paid out externally. Uh, and so, that's so what you're saying is sometimes people have to like pass it off to Stripe. Yeah. And then have Stripe and then you, pass it back to say, all right, they bought this and paid for it. Exactly. So, so, so you end up pretty much rewriting that whole order for Stripe, because Stripe's not going to take the same format that the checkout input would. So you end up rewriting that whole order, items and everything, for Stripe, processing that in that <laughs> on Stripe, and then creating your order through checkout, marking it as already being paid. They have no... And so this means... So you remove the ability for you to do a refund through WooCommerce. You... uh you end up with probably far more overhead and like actions being done that you don't really necessarily need as far as like, um, like for instance, say I have this checkout page and I want to support not just Stripe, but Apple Pay and pretty much anything else beyond just Apple Pay and Stripe is like, say I want to support those. All right, I wrote it. And so now I support, I, I, now it supports Stripe. I have to do the same thing for Apple Pay, including the the prepackaging of the order and all the and then the post order creation to check out or uh, check out mutation. It's really not like I don't think it's ideal for most situations. As opposed to how much easier would it be to restyle this to like your application? And if anyone's complaining about the uh, the endpoint, I mean like but like the actual. Uh, URL, 
this URL is this is an example, right? This URL is really the back end for this is really something else. And I proxy passed this on this on the checkout route alone. I just mm. proxy passed on this. And it looks like it's within the rest of the application that is at WeGraphQL.com. Yeah. Uh, it's it, it's it's a, it's no different. Like uh so and the thing is you can still you can package this in a mobile app. You can still put this in like, or like you can still package the the web view page as if it's a part of the application in almost every instance. Interesting. Well, that that seems like a piece of content I might want to dig into later. Like thinking to talking about that specific thing in in, in itself, just like the checkout page. Yeah. Um, there's a checkout mutation, but the thing is, there is a checkout mutation in it. It can be used, like I said, for like for, but the, the whole reason for its existence is for repeat buyers. Okay. <laughs> that's that's primary. Like, like, like if, like, say you, if you want to do checkout again, you don't actually have to send it. If it's an existing customer where an existing payment method, you don't have to send them to the checkout page. Okay. You, you can they just, just run a checkout mutation. You already have all the info. The reason for the checkout page is for, is because you have no way. Of add, there's no way for me even to even write a mutation that would allow a user to add a custom payment token. Okay. WooCommerce, uh, simply because the way WooCommerce designs those gateway, those payment gateway tokens is it allows for a lot of freedom of the people who generate them. So gateways tend to design them in very unique ways, looking for spe very specific post uh post request headers when you send the request and no other alternatives for having to provide that for, for being able to provide that data on payment processing but and you're like, saying if they've already established that particular payment gateway they already have that token and then you're good to go and could use that yep. checkout mutation okay interesting cool cool like the, the payment method is already there is readily available to us on the other side we can readily see it we don't really yeah. need any information from it. We can just say, hey, we're doing another order. This is the payment method we're using. Use their default payment method and that's connected to this gateway. Yeah. And and I realize now I'm just looking at the time. Looks like we're just a, a little bit over our one hour slot. Um, oh, so I don't know, Jeff, if there's anything, um, <laughs> anything else you want to show. I mean, if you got some questions... Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep, you got to leave us with some GraphQL, Woo GraphQL Pro. Um, so, what I do? I don't know if you could drop us some details on that before we all bounce. And then, if you got any other lingering questions or want us to circle back on anything, uh, throw it, throw it in the chat. Yeah. Let me stop sharing now. Oh well, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, so uh, we got some questions about Woo GraphQL Pro. So what? Let me what are, what are some of the benefits of that? All right. So Woo GraphQL Pro provides um, more support for extension. Like out of the box, WP GraphQL, WooCommerce, and Woo GraphQL only supports core WooCommerce. Woo GraphQL Pro, uh, Pro adds support for subscriptions, product add-ons, product uh, composite products, and product bundles. Uh, likely to add more functionality in the future but those were the those are the four most popular plugins uh and i kind of just started with those first uh okay so we got more more functionality um probably support i mean i know you do great support for free plugins so i'm not even going to say better um but oh no no it's, it's like it's the it's the it's, it's yeah, there, there's no difference in the quality of the support. it's mostly just the fact that like this is something that it's all the other things I tend to work on. I tend to use. I'm not you. Besides subscriptions, I'm not really using too many of the other ones. So this is just pretty much just the fun, me, being able to do it without having anything to uh, do with it. And I think there's like bugs on that page. Am I? Am I like slap back up something? Yeah. I need kind of. <laughs> I will deal with it when I do it a different time. Deal yeah, with it later. That card looks funny. So does that one. I really is. Oh wow. Oh yeah, maybe there's a little bit of border down there or something. That one looks a little shifted. Yeah, this is because recently I ended up using a uh, Shad UI, uh, Shad Z UI index and stuff. And the aspect ratio uh card. There's nothing like talking player. about your work in public to surface a bunch of bugs that you didn't know about. That's for sure. Yeah. 
Like uh, I, I know that to be the truth. Um, cool. So we got any other questions? That's sort of GraphQL Pro. Um, Andre wants to know how can you be reached for consultancy services? You might be interested. Oh, um, um, oh yeah, so, so yeah. several places. Uh, but primarily on the con on the contact form on the support page there, or on the contact form of. Uh, of uh okay. access taylor and specifically those are for consult if you if, if you have something if, if it's something more personal find me in slack <laughs> yeah uh, but if, if, if it's a question pertaining to woo graphql or consultancy work in general that the contact form here uh you see you see the subject for it if you drop down some uh, oh cool we're at headless wordpress consultation yeah and, and then also the support page on access taylor.com Okay. Yeah. And I don't think we put that one in here. So I don't have the link to that offhand, but I'll throw, I can throw it in Slack or something yeah. later. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. Any other questions for Jeff while we're here? Awesome. Yeah. Thanks a lot. What, what are you working on next? That's the question uh, everybody wants to know. Uh, <laughs> your guess is as good as mine, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Something with WP GraphQL, we can assume though. That's for sure. Oh, you do so much work there. And we all we all benefit from that. So just heartfelt thanks again from the community. Um, dude, thanks for putting all this together. I definitely look forward to showcasing it. I'll I'll tweet out the video when it's out. Um oh, you do and put it in Discord, <laughs> put it in Slack. No, man, this was a great demo. Look, uh, and I think like I prepared all that crap, but I didn't use any of it. <laughs> yeah, well, hold on, hold on. I got one question because Jeff and I talked about this before. So for you all, what what was our thing? Boilerplates or libraries? What would you rather oh, start yeah. with? Boilerplates. Because I'm trying to convince Jeff he needs to, like, take that that thing one step further. And he needs, like, his own Woo Next, like the Woo Next uh, Scotty Kennedy has, saying you need Woo Next and – Libraries. Oh, oh, David, man. David, 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 I know, like, but I knew, I knew David was going to say libraries. libraries. <laughs> I knew David was going to say libraries. I'm I'm going boilerplate. I want a boilerplate. No, I want a store. I think boilerplates is more discouraging to people who aren't already familiar with the base. So like like if the like, like the thing is like if you get a a lot of times you end up with a boilerplate with a lot more noise than what you want. And so you tend to either, and you never remove it. Like you ever, you never end up removing that that noise. I mean, like, that's, like, yeah. like no one, people will be like, you, you end up, it's like, it doesn't affect anything. It doesn't show visual, but it's a, it's there in the code, whether it's just- I don't know, man. I'm just it. saying from, from a getting people started perspective, like that's it, That that's it. Is they, they, could, they could do this, they could clone your thing, point it at their endpoint, boom, they've got a store. And if they want to mess with it, they can um i don't know all right we that might be a twitter poll or a discord poll or something where we got to get some more data because be. <laughs> we're split we're split right now 50 50 between boilerplate <laughs> and and libraries because it's really just david and fran um <laughs> he'll die on this hill nobody wants to fight you on this hill david for sure that's why i'm i'm, retreat, I'm retreating we'll go <laughs> we'll go we'll get a different audience um all right yeah, so awesome y'all Thanks so much. <laughs> no, I said I don't want to do that, David. I don't want to do that. But later, y'all, it's been great. <laughs> Jeff, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks, no problem, everybody, man. for hanging out, dude. We appreciate your time and all the work you do. Later. Thanks. See you. Yeah.